Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to this Oxford Translation Day. I'm very sorry not to be in Oxford. I am speaking to you from Athens. My name is Alicia Stallings, and I'm going to be speaking about two um, contemporary women Greek poets. Um, 2020 has been an interesting time for all of us. Um, I think of it uh, early 2020 as BC, before COVID, before coronavirus. Um, so early in 2020, BC, um, two Greek poets uh, reached their definitive translations. Um, a translation from living poets to a body of work. Um, many uh, literary figures in Greece died in the early part of 2020. Um, Katerina Angelaki Rook, I think, was the first um, major uh, literary figure who left us in 2020 in late January. Um, and barely a month after, Kiki Dimula um, also um, was translated to a, to a more definitive edition. Um, and there were other figures um, such as um, uh, Stratis Javieras, Alkize. Um, so there were a lot of losses in quick succession. Um, now I almost think it, there was something in the air that um, these major literary figures um, almost decided to get out um, while they could still have um, funerals that were large gatherings of their um, friends and family and admirers and um, before now when um, funerals are very small, um, uh, very important um, hero in Greece, um, Manolis Glezos, um, died during the lockdown and in normal times his funeral would have attracted thousands and thousands of people. Um, and it was only a handful of um, very close family members and pallbearers. He was the person who, as a lad um, under Nazi occupation, scaled the Acropolis and took down the Nazi flag. So this huge figure who had this sad funeral. So in a way, I'm glad that um, we were able to say goodbye to these women um, as, as large groups of, of friends and family and admirers, I was able to go to both funerals. And in a way, the two funerals were also indicative of these two very different poets. Um, Katerina Angelaki Rook was born in Athens in 1939. Um, Kiki Di Mula was born in Athens in 1931. So they're roughly the same generation. And even though they were both born in Athens in a similar time, um, both uh, grew up under Nazi occupation, under um, Greek civil war, um, came to a certain age under um, um, the junta period. Uh, they were so very different as poets and as people. And in a way, the funerals kind of reflected that. They were kind of translations of that as well. Katerina's funeral um, was on the island of Egina. Um, I was able to go out there with some friends for the funeral, it was a beautiful day. We sailed on the Greek sea, um, arrived on Egina Island, which was her favorite place, I think, on, on Earth. Um, uh, we were able to have a lovely lunch and go to this funeral where um, there were friends from um, the UK, friends from Athens, English speakers, Greek speakers, um, Albanians. Um, uh, people weeping very openly. It was a very friendly, um, uh, not festive, a funeral can't be festive, but there was this feeling of coming together. Um, Kiki Di Mula's funeral, both funerals were at state expense um, because these women are so um, respected and important as poets um, to Greek society and because poetry is so important. That's, that's something to say also. Um, Kiki Di Mula's poem, uh, poem funeral, rather, um, was uh, took place in um, the uh, first cemetery in Athens, which is a beautiful, rather grand, formal cemetery. Um, I think it was founded in 1837. Um, has all this wonderful statuary. Um, there were figures of state. I believe even the president of Greece was there. 
30 wreaths, a uh, chrysanthemum of wreaths from um, literary societies and politicians, um, a rather well-heeled um, bourgeois set of Athenians um, there to, to bid her farewell. So there was a kind of, even the maybe the more loose, easygoing funeral of Katerina's and the much more formal funeral of Dimula is in a way, I think, befit their, their poetries in a certain way. Um, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about these two poets. Um, I'm not sure how they would have felt about being spoken of together. I think being from a kind of similar generation and being women poets in Greece, um, they were often compared. And um, I, I not say that there's a competition, but I think would, you know, would not perhaps have been thrilled to be the, the subject together of this, of this talk. Um, but I think because they are so different, um, it's, it's useful to look at them as a way of looking at Greek letters. And it's important to think of these women poets as coming after um, the World War II poets. They're kind of perhaps in the shadow of people like Sever Seferis and Kavafi and Elitis, um, and these very heavy, strong male poets. I think many male poets of their generation, of Katerina Angelaki Rooks and Kiki Dimula's generation, um, felt a bit more in the shadow of these great major figures. And I think both Katerina Angelaki Rook and um, Kiki Dimula instead found a kind of space there, this feminine, maybe negative, um, domestic space in some cases. Um, but anyway, I don't think they felt quite as oppressed in some ways as their male counterparts. So that um, is certainly very interesting to me. I actually met Katerina, Katerina um, in 1999 when I first moved to Athens, Greece um, from Atlanta, Georgia. Our friend, um, American poet um, David Mason introduced us, took us out to a taverna lunch um, in Plaka, uh, there was free-flowing barrel wine. Um, Katerina, you know, was loud and boisterous, um, telling her her dirty jokes, and um, you know, we had a great time. This feeling of of larger than lifeness, even though she was quite a diminutive person, um, she suffered from some physical um, limitations and a great deal of pain. She'd been born a quite healthy. Um, baby and um, later suffered an infection that um, caused her a lot of physical problems and a whole childhood of um, very painful surgeries. Um, and she's a poet, I think it is most often thought of as a poet of the physical and of the body, of the erotic. Um, she's, she opens up, I think, in Greek poetry and Greek letters. You know, Kavafi had spoken very frankly about um, homosexual love and you have these poets speaking from the male gaze, and she spoke about um, the erotic and the physical, very much from the point of view of, of the female um, gazing at the male. Um, so that's one of her, her interesting subjects, um, a female gaze of longing and desire on male beauty, on a male muse. Um, you know, one of her poems is entitled, The Body is the Victory and the Defeat of Dreams. So she's always aware of being in a body, being embodied, um, uh, aware of this um, physical aspect. Um, so that was definitely one of, of the aspects of her poetry. Um, she also was a translator herself, um, probably the most important to her, I think, um, aspect of her stars overlooking her birth. She talks about a scar rather than a star overseeing her birth, but in a sense, her godfather, um, who is cousin Zakis, is a terribly important figure for her that she had that, that stamp of approval. And he was um, one of the first people to publish or to write about her poetry when she was only 17. Um, and uh, she had a Russian nanny. She spoke Russian. Her English, while not native speaker, was nearly perfect. Uh, had a wonderful grasp of the idiomatic, and she was very interested in English idiom, and she married um, a British classicist. So in a sense, she also married into English. She was herself a translator.
Katerina was most proud of her translation into Greek of um, uh, Pushkin's Onegin, um, and she did that into Greek uh, stanzas um, that exactly reflected um, the rhyme and the meter of the Russian. Um, she also translated sometimes with a collaborator, um, Seamus Heaney, Derek Walcott. Um, she had a lot of friends who were translators, um, Karen Van Dyke, Jackie Wilcox, um, Stephanos Papadopoulos, where there was a certain amount of give and take um, translating each other or translating in tandem. Um, so translation was very much, in fact, that's one of the few ways she actually earned any money um, was by the act of translation. So to a certain extent, um, her own poetry is written, I think, and this has been written about, um, including by Karen Van Dyke, who gave a very interesting talk about Katerina's um, work as one of the um, Kimon Friar lectures um, in Athens, uh, that she's sort of aware of the possibilities of translation even as she's writing the poem in Greek. And um, in all of this kind of makes her very much the opposite um, of the Mula, who has a completely different um, outlook and attitude, I think, to this. Um, Katerina has a lot of um, interviews online. You can see her talking about language. One of the things she would say is um, when something is said in a different language, it, it means something else. So even if it's a perfect translation, it is still changed. She used to talk about in, in English, if you hurt yourself, you say ouch. But in Greek, when you hurt yourself, you say ach. And that this ach is a completely different kind of pain from the English ouch. I would say it's the ach of Achilles. In an interview um, on uh, Poyen and Pratain, um, Katerina says, to quote George Steiner, certain cultures speak less than others. Some modes of sensibility prize taciturnity and elision. Others reward pro prolixity and semantic ornamentation. Elsewhere, I think, he says, that English is a language that was made in order to conceal more than to reveal. And obviously, Greek is the exact opposite, she says. The fact that in English you can talk for some length about your love without having to disclose, grammatically speaking, the sex of the object of your adoration is, I think, quite indicative. I am not a linguist, but I have a feeling that grammar is like the gestures of a person. They betray this person's weaknesses and strengths. An inflected language gesticulates so much more than a non-inflected one, um, she says. And in a, to a certain degree, um, Kiki Diwala feels almost exactly the opposite. She speaks about being able to hide in Greek. Um, and um, so they, they have very different um, outlooks about translation and maybe even about Greek, even though I think they very much feel um, that the mother tongue language itself is where their poetry is centered. Um, Kiki Di Mula was born in Athens in 1931, appropriately enough, on Pythia Street. And she lived and moved in a very limited neighborhood and milieu. Um, and on one level, Di Mula's poetry reflects um, the humdrum and rather claustrophobic circumstances of her life. Um, she ends up marrying her math tutor, who is also a poet, and going to live with him and his mother. Um, her unpretentious, flatly unpoetical voice is grounded in the quotidian and the domestic. The floors of her poems are scattered with the detritus of motherhood, Playmobil toys, Superman costumes, Barbie dolls. Her settings include all-night pharmacies, farmer's markets, a daily bus ride to a soul-withering job at a bank. A wreath of cemetery flowers is made of plastic, less leftovers linger in Tupperware, pizzas are delivered on motorbikes. It's very much modern contemporary Athens. She is urban rather than pastoral. Her titles are things like mother of the floor below, shake well before using, repair loans, and the title of one of her books is tellingly, we've moved next door. On another level, her poetry is the opposite of limited. She has a wide ranging imagination and originality of style. The abstract is concrete, the, the physical is metaphysical. The liberties she takes with language have been termed by the poet Tassos Russos 
a surrealism of grammar and syntax. One of the overarching metaphors of her poetry is Greek grammar itself. Her titles include things like the plural and the disjunctive or. She shuffles parts of speech, mimics conjugations and declensions. Modern Greek has lost the infinitive, but that doesn't stop the mula from using one. She cross-dresses grammatical genders and exploits the full formality of the plural and the familiarity of the singular. She delights in puns, something with which Katerina avoids, um, and mints coinages faster than a government up to its eyeballs in hawk. So they are almost opposites in how they use language and in their attitudes towards translation. And I'm going to look at two poems in translation. Um, but I will uh, say this is um, uh, probably the, the main book right now of Kiki de Mulaz, which is in English. Um, it's called The Brazen Plagiarist, Selected Poems, translated um, by Cecile Margelos and Rika Lesser. Um, it's nice in that it has a selection of poems and it has the Greek on facing page um, with the English. Um, and in it, though, she has a, an essay um, at the front, which is called Thoughts of an Awkward Immigrant to a Foreign Language. And it begins, or this is at, towards the beginning, but the important thing is that I'm going into an unknown language filled with apprehension. Even if they say that, knowing how the universal is spoken, poetry is in no danger of losing its way in any otherworldly unknown. That seems to be a very Bimulayan sentence. Um, so her idea of translation is one of anxiety. What's going to happen to her poems as immigrants in another language? Um, they have to, they can only bring some things over with them. Um, the only paint, she calls her translators heroic because she believes that translation is an act of self-abandonment, indeed of self-oblivion. So the translator may enter unprejudiced into otherness so she may break through the secretive precautions the impulsive wording takes in order to prevent its immediate consumption by perception's voracious ease. That's hard to understand in English, um, and you can tell that it was written in Greek. The only painless duty of the translator is to bring the dictionaries of two languages, strangers to one another face to face, and force them to speak to each other. It's interesting that Katerina also talks about the two languages, but she says, what if you had two friends? that you wanted to get together, but you knew they had nothing in common. So it's interesting that Vimula talks about the two languages as being two strangers, and Katerina talks about them as being two friends, um, but friends that might not have anything in common. Um, so I'm going to talk about ind two individual poems, um, uh, one from each. Um, I think I will start with um, a poem of Katerina Angalaki Rooks. It's actually the title poem translating into love life's end and in this book um you'll see that it doesn't talk about a translator here um but later i think she talks about co-translating some of these um uh to thank roger green and rodney rook for help with the translations so in this case um there have been people helping this but it's also kind of her own translation um and if you can see metaphras on this Se erotatis zois dotelos. It's dedicated to a person named P.S. Um, translating into love, life's end. Well, even from the beginning, and Karen Van Dyke writes about this um, in a, a talk that she gave about this poem, because she also translates this poem. Um, translating into love, life's end. That's not very English syntax. And um, Katerina has clearly given her stamp of approval to this strange sounding title, which puts us in mind that this poem is going to be in translation. And I feel that Katerina was quite aware that this poem was going to be translated, and it's about translation. Translating into love life's end. Since I cannot touch you with my tongue, I translate my passion. I cannot communicate, so I transubstantiate. I cannot undress you, so I dress you with the fantasy of a foreign tongue. Under your wings I cannot nestle, so I fly around turning the pages of your dictionary. I want to know how you strip, how you open up, 
so I look for your habits in between your lines, for your favorite fruit, for your favorite smells, girls you leaf through. I'll never see your punctuation marks naked. I work hard on your adjectives so that I can recite them in the susurrations of another religion. But my story has aged, my volume adorns no shelf, and I imagine you now with a rare gold leather binding in a foreign library, because I should never have indulged in the luxury of nostalgia and written this poem, I am reading the gray sky now in a sun-drenched translation. Um, so some of the things um, that, if you can see the Greek, and I'll try to send copies of the Greek as well, um, you. I, since I cannot touch you with my tongue, I translate my passion. But in Greek, glossa is tongue, is language. We can use the word tongue as language in English, but it's slightly elevated or poetic, um, whereas this is simply how language is said in Greek. So um, in my tongue, I cannot touch you. Um, since I cannot touch you with my tongue, I translate my passion, metaglotis, metaglotizo. Um, uh, which is translate, but also has the word tongue in it, um, which you can't do in English. I translate my passion. I cannot communicate, so I transubstantiate, and all of those have the meta um, in them. Um, things like punctuation marks, simadia, um, could simply be marks on the skin, and Karen Van Dyke talks about that in her discussion of this poem. Um, so even though uh, Car uh, Katerina talks about not being a big fan of puns in, in poetry, this is a poem that is very engaged with its own translation, and so it has some nearly untranslatable things in it. Um, this is Karen Van Dyke's uh, version of the same poem, and she says, translating life's end into love, which is a much more... Um, English syntax, I think, than translating into love, life's end. And yet, as you can see, since it is the title of this book, Katerina is quite deliberate about um, making it strange. Um, because I cannot touch you with my tongue, I transliterate my passion. That's interesting. Um, although um, metaglotizo, um, I think, is more usually used in Greek to dub um, uh, when we see films, when children see f English films in Greece, um, rather than having subtitles, they are always dubbed uh, metaglos glotis meno. Is it? Um, so, anyway, uh, because I cannot take your communion, I transubstantiate you. That's nice. Because I cannot undress you, I imagine you in the clothes of a foreign language. Because I cannot nestle under your wing, I fly around you, turning the pages of your dictionary. I want to learn how you bear yourself, how you open yourself up. That's why I search between the lines for your habits, the fruits you love, the smells you prefer, the girls you leaf through. Because I'll never see your punctuation marks naked, I work hard on your adjectives so I can recite them in another religion. Um, she gets rid of that susurration that we have in the other poem. Um, which has a, a word that it's representing in Greek, but it does kind of stick out. Now that my story's old and my book's no longer on the shelf, it's you, I imagine, in a rare leather binding with gold lettering in a foreign library because I should never have given in to the indulgence of nostalgia and written this poem, I read the gray sky in a sun-drenched translation. I think one of the things you can see is that even though you've got two translations that are making some different choices, um, they still sound very similar, which I think says something about Katerina's poem. Um, there are some things that you can move around or play around with, um, but also there's a certain way in which the poem resists some of that and is going to come across very similarly no matter what you do in English. There are choices um, to leaf through the girls, um, uh, I think it's xephinesis, um, you know, you could do something maybe more physical or erotic, even though it is literally leaf through, maybe you thumb through the girls, I don't know. But, um, so that's a poem that's about translation and um, is itself very engaged with its own act of translation. Now, Kiki Di Mula is a poet 
who was kind of concerned with the untranslatable. So here we have the brazen plagiarist, and one of the things that I do very much appreciate about this book, um, I have reviews that, reviewed this book and talked about some of the problems also, um, but uh, I love having um, the Greek on the facing page, and, and that's also a way where it, the translation ends up being much more engaged because it's physically facing the poem. I'm going to read it in English and um, then maybe try to read it in Greek or talk a little bit about it in Greek. The Brazen Plagiarist. Of the unremitting civil war between existing and ceasing to, between speaking and ceasing to, finally, the only winner is that famous war correspondent writing a brazen, unholy plagiarist, it copies both speaking and ceasing to exist, expertly forged as lasting in the paper's closed-mouthed ear. Now, this poem, which is the title poem of The Brazen Plagiarist, and I think is an Ars Poetica for Kiki Di Mula, is unfortunately also very, very difficult to translate into English. It is very resistant, recalcitrant to translation. For instance, the title. We have um, Ithracia Logoklopos, the brazen plagiarist. But in Greek, this has a gender. It is not just a brazen plagiarist. It is she, the brazen plagiarist. It's not that strong, but you also can't avoid it. It is a female plagiarist. Um, also, logoklopos is a kind of more resonant word with poetry than plagiarist. Um, logoklopos is literally word thief, which is nice. So the bold word thief, the bold female word thief, has a kind of different um, weight and resonance in English. Um, the translator, um, Rika Lesser, um, has delayed finally to the end of this for some reason, but it begins with finally. I think that's a very different choice. And I'm not sure why the translator hasn't simply kept that choice. Finally. Um, from the ceaseless, but uh, asigasto has to do also with noise, the, the always... I can't even think of a good word. Um, and of course we have civil war, which in a Greek poem is going to bring in mind the civil war. It's going to be very, very powerful and freighted. And here we have between existing and ceasing to, instead we have metaxi to ipacho ke tu pavo. This is between the I exist and the I cease or pause maybe to exist. Um, again, modern Greek does not have an infinitive. This might be kind of a, a workaround for that. Um, but it's also got the I in it, between the I exist and the I pause, between the um, I speak and um, the I pass over in silence. Um, so that's very different between speaking and ceasing to finally. The only winner is, and again, the gender, E, the female, um, the, the only winner is, she, the only winner is, the famous, she again, that one, um, war correspondent. And it's also clear in the Greek that the war correspondent is writing itself. I think that's not very clear in the English unless you have read the Greek. The only winner is that famous war correspondent writing. That writing might be a gerund, it might be what the war correspondent is doing, it's not clear that writing is itself the foreign correspondent. An unholy brazen plagiarist, but again, all in the feminine. Um, she copy, it copies, I would say she copies, even though writing you could say it. She copies both the I speak and the I have passed over in silence um, to exist. Epidexia is um, adroitly, deftly, it has to do with the right hand, the opposite of awkward. Um, and then Forgery, this is forgery, para pi menno, um, forged as I last, diarco. That's stronger, I think, than lasting. 
it's the I last, I persist. Um, but also the para pi meno, it is the word for to have counterfeited something, but it contains within it poem, the made thing. So that poem is kind of smuggled in there, in that word. Um, in the discreet ear of the paper. Um, so this is kind of an interesting poem to have chosen. Um, I think it does represent an Ars Poetica um, about how much is hidden within writing, how writing is an answer to censorship, both political censorship and maybe personal censorship, all of this being more fraught in modern Greek. Um, but you can see how uh, the translation almost just throws up its hands. And I, in a way, don't blame it. There's not, there are not easy solutions to any of these. Um, but I kind of wished it had tried a little harder. Um, some other translations in here are much more successful. Um, so you can see that those two poems, which are both somewhat ars poeticas, ars poetic, um, are so, so very different. And, um, you know, Katerina also says, if I can find my note. Um, well, here's something that um, Karen Van Dyke says about Katerina. Her project can be distinguished from that of much Greek poetry that privileges Greeks' complexities and idiosyncrasies. Hers, for example, is not the intricate cunning of Gigi Gula, who treats the Greek language like an acrobat balancing whole metaphysical arguments on a part of speech, which he does. How is it possible to translate into English the second person singular imperative of the Mula's title, Hiere Pote, greet, neverness, hail, never, I think hail, never is fine. Um, mine, and Galaki wrote, clarifies, is different. If you don't get the pun, you don't lose much. I am not interested in distorting reality when I play with language. So it's not that Katerina Angelaki Rook does not use puns, but she doesn't really care whether they, it's not, the whole poem isn't based on that pivot. While Dimala focuses on what isn't translatable and what is only possible in Greek, Angelaki Rook emphasizes what is translatable, especially into English. So these are two very um, different viewpoints. And I'm going to read two last um, poems by these without um, alternate translations, but to give you a sense also of them as poets. Can we pause that? Go. So I'm going to read um, a poem by each of our poets that I think also addresses um, the coronavirus moment and our quarantine in a way, even though they themselves did not live to see this moment. But that's one of the things I love about poetry is it's prophetic. It speaks to the future without the poets knowing so. I know one of the things that many of us have been concerned about is not being able to have our hair done or get our hair cut. And so I thought I would read this poem translated by the poet and Jackie Wilcox um, by Katerina Rook called The Barbershop. And I think it shows a lot of things about Katerina. It shows um, her playfulness. It shows her, her female gaze at male beauty, her frankness of physical desire. It is playful when it comes to the ancient world. I think that's one of the things that the women poets have shown the way for the male poets who often feel more oppressed by the ancient world. It has a little bit of an illusion in there, but again, this is worn very lightly. The Barbershop. A white rose, the barber's towel around your face, shining like a beetle clinging to the petals, clippings scattered on the floor, were the days when I loved you so much while the garrulous sculptor of heads cuts away what time has made superfluous. Ah, that unscrupulous hand made you even more beautiful. The curve of your eyebrows more clearly defined and beneath the jade of your eyes, your flowers, your lips half opened. The shop impressed itself on my mind in all its detail and little by little, the nothingness which my life would soon become without you, came crawling into the scented room. You smiled in the mirror, and I crumbled, because I had you and would lose you, like life classically cut short by a pair of ancient scissors.
So I think in some ways this is a setting that could be out of a Kavafi poem. The idea of seeing someone in a barber shop and the shop remembering in all its detail remembered in all its details. And I think it's also a bit of a nod to Seferis in Mythistorima when he says, I woke with this marble head in my hands, the sculptor of heads. Um, and yet it's also entirely Katerina. Um, in some ways, Kiki di Mola is very much a poem of quarantine. Her poems are often about um, being in an enclosed space, not having much room um, to move through, um, but having to make your imagination there. Um, this one is translated by Adrian Kalfapulu, and it is titled At Home. I'll stay in myself even more. You are free to think. Sin, confess. You regret with difficulty what's not easy to forget. What was suffered as so much hell or sin for such a small piece of paradise. I'll stay inside then. It's so completely open. Though I have no horizon left. The outside isn't the only provider. This horizon is made of need. How much do you need it? How much do you want it closer? faster. Do you want it plain, with stars and a slice of moon, or only with God? If it's only with God, it will cost you. After all, any faith, even undecided ones, cost. It requires you to spend yourself completely. So I think also you can see in that poem um, Bimula's engagement um, with religion, um, with particularly um, Greek Orthodox religion. I'd like to end on a little bit of something that um, Katerina wrote about translation. I was going to call this talk, Blame the Translator. Um, and she talks about uh, how, what happens when she is involved in translating her own work. Are things easier when the object of my translating work is my own poetry? Hardly. The fact is that I never take full responsibility. I don't sign, that is, when I translate into English. I always collaborate with a native speaker. I wish I could do this in her voice. Two collections of poems have appeared, of mine have appeared in the States, one in 76 and one in 86. First one I collaborated with an American poet, Philip Bramp, the second with an English, um, Jackie Wilcox. In both cases, the English-speaking counterpart had a rather limited knowledge of Greek and very few of the nuances of the original could be grasped without explanation. Now what is interesting, I noticed to my great surprise that very quickly I started distancing myself from the text, feeling less and less that I was the author of the original. In a way, I was disowning my poems. So I would analyze less and less this or that image and its implications for the whole poem. The truth is that I was slipping into the personality of the translation a position I found more comfortable. I was more anxious to find a translating solution to a given problem than to render exactly in English what I had written in Greek. After all, translating was interpreting. Why shouldn't my poems have more than one angle? Or better still, why should I be the one who held the key to the right one? I was a bit disappointed, though. I thought my poems would put up a much bigger fight. They would raise demands. Was I discovering they were less good than I thought? Or on the contrary, was I so conceited that I believed they were so good that no bad translation could harm them? And did I feel that what I was saying in these poems had to come across in the other languages at all costs? What I was wrote, or that what I wrote was so inseparable from the language in which it was written? These trite for all translations questions, I can assure you, they sound quite different if they are printed on your own skin. Yes, being the author was really very dangerous. Another routine question for translation of literature is, is this piece of literature worth translating? You ask yourself that question, it may be fatal. So it is much easier to feel that you are the translator, with or without quotes. And what if, one could argue, translating your own work helps you to correct her or his mistakes? Bah, no such chance, because what a poet instinctively does is to blame the translator. So I love that idea of her blaming the translator even when she is herself the translator. It's a variation on blame the messenger, except in this case, the messenger isn't bringing bad news, but good news. So I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about these poets and we'll look for more of their work. Thank you.